Good morning. I would like to first welcome our incredibly brave and distinguished panel who all bear witness in powerful ways to nine years of war in Syria and the depravities and atrocities that the Syrian people have suffered. Also, warm greetings to all of you participating in this important event by watching online. And thank you for tuning in and understanding the Washington Institute's decision to move this event from an in-person to a virtual platform. First, I'm gonna share with everybody how we're gonna proceed with this morning's policy forum. After introducing the panelists, I will ask each of them to make an initial question, each of them to answer an initial question or two if there's time. To our participants, as our discussion here prompts your own questions, please send your questions to policyforum at washingtoninstitute.org. Again, that's policyforum at washingtoninstitute.org. In this email, please tell us your name, where you are located, with what organization you are affiliated, to whom you are directing your question, unless you would like the whole panel to address your question, and then write us your question. We have staff monitoring this email address for incoming questions, and we will work through as many as we have time for. Again. Policy Forum at WashingtonInstitute.org. At the end of our discussion, Naomi K. Kohler will close the policy forum with some reflections. She directs the Center for Prevention of Genocide at the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum. This month, the war in Syria enters its 10th year. Yesterday, two hearings were held in Congress, one in the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, featuring both Rod and Omar testifying alongside Caesar the military Syrian defector who exposed to the world the systemized torture of Assad's torture machine and his crimes against humanity. Last year, Congress passed the Caesar Civilian Protection Act, legislation to impose sanctions on anyone who backs Assad, specifically Russia and Iran. So it shows you the power of what Caesar did and the bravery in smuggling out that documentation and how it can spur Washington to act. Last October, Syria and the U.S. role in Syria received massive amounts of media attention when President Trump announced the withdrawal of U.S. forces from northeast Syria and Turkey launched a military incursion. Members of Congress demanded briefings and hearings. Policy experts in Washington consistently and publicly made the case to the American people on the need for continued investment in Syria. In contrast, the Assad-Russia-Iran offensive in Idlib in northwest Syria which has sparked the worst humanitarian crisis of the entire nine-year war with one million people displaced in 60 days, has received significantly less attention. This time, Turkey launched military operations into northwest Syria and inflicted serious damage on Assad's forces. This prompted Russia to seek a ceasefire, which Turkish President Erdogan agreed to on March 5th. Yet we have seen limited media attention here in the United States, no meaningful congressional action, minimal expressions of support for Turkey, a NATO ally, to take any actions to further mitigate uh, operations by Assad. Here are the questions for us today. Will the March 5th Turkey-Russia ceasefire hold? What will happen to the one million Syrian civilians essentially living in an open air prison in Idlib pushed up against the Turkish border? What should the U.S. do if the ceasefire collapses? What will Turkey, Russia, Iran, and Assad do? What are the consequences of Idlib's collapse? What are the consequences of failure to act by the United States and Europe, or those in the region? And finally, after nine years of war, as this war enters its 10th year, what do the Syrian people want, and what are they seeking from the United States? To answer these questions, we have an incredible panel here today. I'm going to start on that side. We have Raad Al-Sala, who is the chairman of Syria Civil Defense, or the White Helmets. Keenan Rahmani is translating for Raad. Omar al Shogri is the director of detainee affairs for the Syrian Emergency Task Force. And finally, Raj Al-Tali, who is the co-founder and co-director of the Center for Civil Society and Democracy, a Syrian non-government organization that trains civil society activists and documents human rights abuses. Thank you so much to our panel for being with us this morning. I'm gonna start with the first question to Rod. In the hearing yesterday, in the other hearing yesterday in the House Foreign Affairs, one of the big questions asked by members of Congress 
was the role of the United Nations Security Council and Russia in blocking resolutions on everything from accountability for atrocities in Syria to cross-border access for the delivery of life-saving humanitarian aid. This past January, Russia and China vetoed the renewal of a resolution that would allow humanitarian aid to flow into Syria from four cross-border areas without Assad's approval. Instead, there is a new six-month resolution that allows for only two cross-border points. If this resolution is not renewed in July, what is going to happen? Will Syrians in need in Idlib still receive emergency aid? حقيقة يعني الشعب السوري وضع تحت رحمة روسيا بكل شيء يعني فعليا اليوم الشعب السوري اللي عايش بسوريا هو تحت عايش تحت طيران تحت رحمة الطيران الروسي بالإضافة عايش بمجلس الأمن عايش تحت رحمة الفيتو الروسي يعني the, re- the reality is that the Syrian people now are at the mercy of Russia at every forum in Syria, they're at the mercy of Russian warplanes that can bomb them at any moment. And at the Security Council, they're at the mercy of the Russian veto, which can veto any resolution. يعني روسيا اليوم تستحق لقب حامية الدكتاتوري أو حامية المجرمين في العالم. Turkey, uh, Russia now has, Russia now has earned the title of the protector of dictators around the world. عدم تجديد قانون الكروس بوردر إلى سوريا حقيقة هو بيعني إنه أربعة مليون نسمة راح يكون راح تكون تحت خطر المجاعة. The veto of another resolution for humanitarian assistance will mean that four million Syrians are now at risk of starvation. لأنه اليوم في سهولة لعبور المساعدات من تركيا إلى سوريا وفي سهولة لوصول المساعدات إلى مستحقينا تحت رقابة دولية وإجراءات صارمة. Today, there is ease of access, relative ease of access for humanitarian aid to reach uh, inside of Syria across the Turkish border. And that aid can be easily delivered to Syrians who are in desperate need under international supervision. But if this resolution is not extended, if the humanitarian assistance is not extended, then how will humanitarian assistance continue to be delivered to these people? At that point, further aid distribution will be under the mercy of the Syrian intelligence. إني مصير مثل مصير أهلنا سابقا بدارية والغوط الشرقي والزبداني بعد أربع سنوات ممكن يبعتولن أكفان للموت أو ممكن يبعتولن ناموسيات. If that happens, if the resolution is not extended, then those millions of IDPs who are on the Syrian Turkish border uh, will ha- suffer the same fate as the millions of people who are our brothers and sisters in besieged communities who remained under siege for years in Daraya and other areas across Syria, um, who after years of being starved would only be allowed to have um, mosquito nets or um, coffins. لأنه من 2016 إلى الآن كان في هناك حديث عن طبعا حسب ما هن بيوصفوها عمليات اتفاقيات للمناطق المحاصرة واللي هي جملة حلب الشرقية وشملة الغوطة الشرقية ودارية والزبداني وكل المناطق اللي كانت محاصرة سابقا وقالوا انه هني رح يبدأوا بعمليات اعادة الاستقرار ودعم المدنيين ليرجعوا لمناطقهم And these areas like Eastern Ghouta and, um, and, the suburb, and uh, Aleppo and other areas which were under siege now there's um, efforts by the regime to rebuild those areas and allow people to return. لكن مين رجع؟ But who was able to go? أكيد العدد قليل جدا واللي رجع تم اعتقال أو تم اختفاء قسريا. There was a very very small number of people who were allowed to return and many of those who returned were forcibly disappeared or arrested by the والمساعدات والمساعدات الأممية التي تصرف عن طريق دمشق يستخدم جزء كبير منها لأهداف سياسية. And the humanitarian assistance 
the international aid that's going through the UN Damascus office is being politicized and used to further a political agenda. لذلك اصلا لذلك من المعيب ان يكون قرار عبور المساعدات الى المحتاجين في سوريا هو في مجلس الامن. يجب هذه القرارات ان لا تكون تحت سلطه احد وان لا تكون لا يستطيع احد منع المساعدات الانسانيه بالوصول لاي محتاج في اي مكان بالعالم وليس فقط في سوريا. It's a shame that these debates are having to be had at the Security Council. All of these resolutions should be taken out of the forum of the Security Council. Humanitarian assistance should not be uh, able to be vetoed or um, stopped by any uh, single party. وأعتقد أن القوانين الدولية الإنسانية تسمح بوصول المساعدات لأي منط لأي مدنيين محتاجين بأي منطقة بغض النظر عن الموافقات التي تحتاجها مثل ما يتكلمون الآن. I would argue that international humanitarian law permits and obligates states to be able to deliver humanitarian assistance to anyone in need regardless of the Security Council. Thank you. Yeah. Omar, during the Senate hearing yesterday, you referenced a one-month period while you were in prison when the torture was less and the guards gave you more food. Can you share with our audience today that experience again and to what event do you attribute this change over that one-month period? Yes, so in prison there is no hope for in the mind of a lot of prisoners. Everybody's like thinking I'm gonna die. I probably, I, I want to die now. I don't want to wait to tomorrow because I will never survive. So, and you're starving all the time. There's no enough food and people forced to kill somebody else. You know, you forced to kill somebody else to survive because sometimes the guard come inside and give food for five people and 95 people don't get any food. They forced to kill this five to share the food. Um, so, and like I was starving in a very long time. I don't know how it felt to be full in my stomach. It was my biggest dream, you know, in a very long period. My biggest dream was to eat once, be full and die. So I didn't get hungry again. So it was a dream for me and a lot of prisoners. And um, suddenly, you, one day came and we got a lot of food and it's nothing good. You don't think about it that in a positive way. You just like, we get a lot of food, we don't eat because it may be like trapped. The regime, the guards trying to do something. Uh, so we got a lot of food, we don't eat it because there's something wrong. There's a lot, they maybe gave food for two rooms and for one. Uh, so we were like really surprised waiting at, until the end of the day and should we eat or not? Everybody's starving. You're looking at the food. A lot of people crying for the first time. They see so much food. They may eat this time and be full for the first time in their life and uh, in their life in prison. And then we decided to eat. And it's like when you decide to eat this food, it's like I'm, I decided to die because if it was a trap in the regime from the guards, we're going to be killed for that uh, if we eat. So we ate this food, and the day after, we got almost the same amount of food. And like, it was really weird when the guards just come inside and they give us food, and they don't, they don't speak the way they speak to us every day, and they don't come inside and don't kill anybody. People just die because they were tortured before, or they sick or something. Like, it went like through one month of having this amazing life, <laughs> if you compare it with the rest of the, of the time in prison, it was like incredible, you wish to stay here forever. Uh, and you're just like, there is something wrong, but we don't care anymore. We eat, we drink, and we're not getting torture. That's what we want, yeah. nothing else. Nobody think about freedom when you are in such situations when you have a really small square and you've been starving for a long time, you didn't have enough water, you didn't shower, you didn't think about freedom. The first thing you think about is food, water, shower, medicine, things like that. So freedom is nothing you think about when you don't have the other things. Um, and after one month, they come back to us with like double amount of torture, less food than when we got first when we get arrested and like we really had, we experienced hell very well. Uh, 
And I got out of prison after a long time and I tried to understand what happened in this specific month. So I tried to see what happened on social media and internet to try to search the news. And it was the date when Caesar pictures get out of the world and they seen the light and everybody was talking about it. You could see that on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram, everywhere, newspaper, all the channel everywhere around the world. And every panel discussion is talking about the Caesar pictures and what's going on in Syrian prisons which make the guards who was working in Syria there and scared for their own life. Because if everybody knows now what they're doing, if every country, every single person ar around the world, th they may be in danger. They're going to be taken to court. They don't want, they probably have families, have a life. They want to continue living this life. So they got scared. We got less torture. It's like I'm talking about the individual level from the guard himself. But it's absolutely coming from like higher level when they order them to stop torture, give more food, and let's see what's going to happen later. But the regime itself, they knew the world going to speak about that for one month or a few days more. But then the, the international community is going to sleep again and they can go back to the torture. So they didn't release people at that time, but we get food. And that was the dream. I get my dreams done at that month. Uh, dream of being full for the first time. So every time we do an event, every time we go for a testimony in the House or the Senate, every time somebody who's famous publish something on social media, it has a big effect because the Syrian army, the Syrian regime, they follow everything going on in social media and news. They follow everything very closely so they know what's going on. They get some a little bit careful when it's needed. Thank you very much. Thanks. Raja, you founded an organization that focuses on empowering civil society to achieve democracy. And one of the things you focus on is documenting human rights abuses in Syria. Can you share with us what the international community can do to support these efforts and what you think are the most critical ways to ensure justice and accountability in Syria are not forgotten? So we've heard now that international action matters for people in prison like Omar, but what can the international community do now? Thank you, Dana, and uh, thank you for the Washington Institute for mm, dedication and continue the event, even though with the coronavirus mm, uh, alert. And also thank you for everyone online who is watching us now. And mm, I really hope that this policy forum help everyone to act, and mm, especially uh, regarding advancing justice and accountability in Syria. Every one of us has a voice and every one of us can do something. It's an honor to be in, beside Omar talking about the detainees and survivor actually of the detention centers in Syria and also to be talking next to Raid, who mm, the heroic action of the civil defense is showing that every single day in Syria. It's very, very hard to talk about justice and accountability in Syria, not because it cannot be happening, but because the Syrian regime from 2011, when the Syrian revolution started uh, asking, like Syrian people, men and women, took the street to ask for freedom, justice, human right. It's a normal ask. The change that needs to happen in Syria its basic rights for everyone around the world. It was targeted by the Syrian forces, the security forces in detention, in firing at people directly, but later on also like going into the cities and villages in Dara, in Daraya, in Banyas and other with tanks. And later on air bombing, shelling, chemical weapons, besieged area. Now we are talking about Idlib to be also sieged. What else? Like I think like there are no other atrocity could be happening in Syria more than that happened. But of course the Syrian regime can always surprise us with more. So every single story that we are hearing from a survivor from detention center in Syria 
it deserves to be heard and it deserves to be acted upon. Every single story that we are hearing from a survivor from besieged area before and until now, it's very important to be documented and to be heard. We shouldn't be forgetting that. Like stories from the World War II is still affecting our action today. And I really hope that we don't need to do that anymore. Like ending the uh, suffering of Syrian people will be here and the ending of the atrocity that the Syrian regime is committing every single day will be end with the help of the international community. With that, how the international community can help in achieving justice and accountability. The most important thing that we shouldn't be giving up. We shouldn't be forgetting the Syrian cause. And this is essential in order to continue. Sometimes, like we remember only the atrocity that is happening right now, yeah. like bombing cities in the Northwest in the last three months. We always, we are talking only about that. And it's a huge uh, crime actually, war crime, what happened, like people, for it, can I, I can give an example of a tarib. Like people at 3 a.m. had to flee from their homes just because of the intensive bombing that happened on uh, February 10th. No one has to go through this. And this is like children, three years old, and women has to go into the street at 3 a.m. to flee from the bombing and free, uh, fleeing from the regime coming to the town. So please make sure that the Syria cause is not forgotten and also make sure that the support for civil society and Syrian women, survivor of detention, the heroic of the civil defense be supported for long period in order to make sure that documenting of human rights violation is going into effect. But not only that, ad addressing all the international Mm, uh, mechanism in order to achieve uh, resolutions, laws, to make sure that accountability will happen in Syria. We will be able to achieve justice in Syria, even if it's not directly now, but in the future. But the most important thing, make sure that we are achieving political solution. We cannot stop the atrocity if transition doesn't happen in Syria. And we have the Security Council Resolution 2254 that based on that, with the help of the United Nations, Office of the Special Envoy for Syria, to achieve political resolution, which makes sure that justice and accountability is there and making sure that transition, political transition towards democracy is happening. Thank you very much. I'd like to remind all of our participants who are following this policy forum online, there's still ample opportunity to ask questions. Again, you could email policyforum at washingtoninstitute.com. No spaces or punctuation. Policyforum at washingtoninstitute.org. Uh, I'd like to go back to Rod for a minute and talk about the work of the Syria Civil Defense on the ground in Idlib today. Since we have seen some of the worst fighting, if not the worst fighting, by Assad and Russia and Iran of the entire war, can you talk about what you're seeing? What are the Iranians doing in Idlib? What are the Russians doing in Idlib? What is Assad aiming to do in Idlib? And based on your organization's work on the ground, do you think the ceasefire between Russia and Turkey will hold? يعني حسب ما خبرنا الروس والنظام خلال تسع سنوات الماضي لا يمكن أنه الهدنة تستمر أو هن يلتزموا بأي اتفاقيات دولية ولا حتى بأي شيء يخص أو يتعلق بالقانون الدولي الإنساني As we've learned from Russia and the regime over the past nine years they will never abide by any ceasefire or by international law فروسيا تعام تلاعبت في كل المصطلحات الدولية التي يتم استخدامها فهي تستخدم مصطلح 
محاربة الإرهاب لقتل المدنيين مثلا وهي تستخدم مصطلح قصف مقرات للقاعدة لاستهداف المستشفيات والمراكز الطبية Russia deceives the international community or attempts to deceive the international community by using um, different excuses. For example, it says that it's fighting terrorism in order to bomb civilians. It says it's fighting the, uh, targeting the bases of Al-Qaeda when it's bombing hospitals and schools. ما نفعله في سوريا نحن عكس ما يفعله كل عمال الإنسانيين في العالم. يعني نحن ما بدل أن نظهر أماكن تواجدنا وأظهار سياراتنا سيارات الإسعاف والإنقاذ نحن نفعل العكس. In Syria we operate differently than humanitarian organizations anywhere else in the world. Instead of clearly marking and labeling um, and communicating where our ambulances are, where our centers are, we try to disguise and hide our presence. نحن نضطر إلى طلي سيارات الإسعاف بالطين والمياه حتى لا يراقبها الطيران ولا يتم استهدافها بشكل مباشر ونضطر إلى حفر المستشفيات تحت الجبال حتى لا يكشفها الطيران أيضا ويتم استهدافها بشكل مستمر We are forced to camouflage our ambulances with mud in order to um, not allow the regime and the Russians specifically to target our ambulances and we're burying and uh, building underground hospitals and centers in order to do the same to prevent the targeting of those centers. But unfortunately, all of these attempts to uh, avoid the deliberate targeting have failed and we continue to be targeted directly and attacked. حتى ابتكرت الأمم المتحدة طريقة لمشاركة أحداثيات المستشفيات مع مع روسيا حتى لا يتم استهدافها حسب طلبهم بذلك الوقت وفعلا المنظمات الطبية في ذلك الوقت شاركت إحداثيات المستشفيات مع الأمم المتحدة حتى يتجنب روس قصفها ولكن ما فعلت روسيا أول شيء تم استهدافه في الحملة الأخيرة هي الإحداثيات التي تم تسليمها عن طريق الأمم المتحدة The United Nations asked hospitals to provide their coordinates in order to deconflict uh, those specific hospitals with the Russians. And that was based on a Russian request because uh, Russia would always say that they didn't know that that was a hospital. And so these um, coordinates, after they were provided to the UN, Russia went and specifically targeted those coordinates of those specific hospitals. And that was the first thing that they did in their latest military operation. وبعد ذلك كل ما فعلته الأمم المتحدة أنها قررت أن تشكل لجنة سرية وغير ملزمة لتحقق من قصف هذه المستشفيات. And the UN's response after that was simply to establish a board of inquiry, which is secret. The results of it will not be public, in order to investigate what happened to those hospitals. ولكن الحملة الأخيرة دعنا نتكلم عن الحملة الأخيرة هي بدأت منذ نيسان الماضي. A moment just to speak about this latest military operation which started in April of last year. منذ بدأت الحملة إلى الآن تم استهداف أكثر من مئة مركز طبي ومستشفى ومركز خلال الخوذ البيضاء. Since the military campaign began last April, there have been over 100 hospitals and white helmet centers that have been directly targeted. There have been 62 schools that have been targeted. Eight schools in a single day. There have been 15 IDP camps which were targeted. There have been more than 9,000 civilian homes which were targeted. More than 100,000 airstrikes. Tens of thousands of rockets and barrel bombs. And they targeted even the escape routes 
which the UN had established as safe routes for civilians to flee across. يعني الحملة بشكل أساسي كانت تهدف إلى أولا قصف كل مقرات التي تساعد على صمود المدنيين ووجودهم بالمنطقة وبعد ذلك استهدافهم ليتم تهجيرهم وبعد ذلك تقوم الطائرات باستهداف الطرق التي يتبعونها للخروج من المنطقة. So to summarize, this military campaign was designed first to target all of the critical civilian infrastructure that civilians need in order to be able to persevere in these conditions. And then after the civilians were forced to flee because of that civilian infrastructure being destroyed, they were targeted again when they were trying to escape to, to safety. لذلك في أول سبعة أشهر في أول ستة أشهر عفوا من ال ال البدء العملي كان سجلنا نحن نزوح حوالي مليون شخص ولكن في آخر سبعين يوم سجلنا مليون آخر. And for this reason, we saw that in the first six months, one million civilians fled, um, fled and became displaced. And in the last 70 days alone, we saw another 1 million people who were displaced in just 70 days. Okay, thank you very much. Omar, a question from you, from our audience, from Dr. Rob Zatloff, the Executive Director of the Washington Institute. He asks, is there creeping normalization of the Assad regime? So, especially in, in the Middle East, in the region, but in other, in other parts of the world as well. We have Resolution 2254, we have a Geneva process, we have the Constitutional Committee, and at every single opportunity, Assad has shown himself unwilling to credibly or meaningfully participate in these processes. Now we're entering our 10th year of this conflict. Are you concerned that there will be normalization of the Assad regime without credible or meaningful reform? I think the countries in the Middle East around Syria is like thinking about that very much like if we think about the Gulf countries and Turkey is the only country not thinking about that right now, I guess. I'm not expert in, in Turkey's uh, position in that, but I think uh, we, we could see through this nine years, none of this Arab countries around did anything for Syrians. Uh, none of them took like really refugees except uh, Jordan, Jordan and, and Lebanon. And people there are not enjoying their life very much. They're being abused uh, specifically very much in Lebanon, unfortunately, with our neighbors. Um, so we, we, and I think all these countries around are scared of revolutions that the Arab Spring gonna gonna attack their countries, take their power. So they wanna do anything to stop what's going on in Syria. Doesn't matter if they support al Assad anything. They don't want the revolution in their own countries. Um, so I think they are supporting the regime. There is definitely a lot of countries around supporting the regime under the table just to to stop what's going on so they their population don't get inspired by the Syrians and um, I, I don't believe in any reconciliation right now because like you can't go back to the regime and say okay now we're friends yeah well we can go that that you know we have a big problem because the regime has used own group like the regime's own group of Allah white to make every almost everybody of them participate in killing somebody else, which made like a lot of hate between groups in Syria. And I remember how it started. It started in my village when they first killed the first Christian guy, Hatem Hanna, and they threw him in a Sunni Muslim area. And the day after we wake up, we didn't kill him. The regime killed him, threw him here, but his mom, when she wakes up, finds his body in our town. She says, you killed him. The day after one of us being killed in a Christian area, and we wake up, this guy, the Christian, killed him. So that's how, and the same thing with Alawite, with Durzi, with every group in Syria. So that's how the regime could could make the problem, it's like, play in his own space. Uh, so the regime could make hate between people, so we don't we don't come together, we can't fight 
the regime together because there is problems. We have differences. We see these differences, and that's a big problem. But in prison, that was very different because we were everybody from everywhere, from in the entire world in prison, and from every different religion. We were together in prison. And um, I don't trust the Syrian regime. I can't trust them after killing f more than 500,000 people after I saw them in prison. Like I saw the guard laughing when he tortured me, when he like put his fingers in my eyes like card. And when he just like forced me to torture my cousin, forced my cousin to torture me and kill people in front of me when I was carrying my cousin to save him. They were hitting me at the same time. They were laughing. I could see like smiling, laughing, enjoying torture. This kind of people, we can't go back to be with them. These people should be in court. And their head, which is the president, the system, the regime itself, we can't live with this kind of people. They should be in court. That's why we can't just say, okay, let's shake hands and go back to have peace in Syria. It's not never going to be a peace with this government. It's impossible. You can't convince the mom who lost, my mom who lost, my father and lost two of her sons and he, she lost, when they attacked our home, they killed more than 50 people in our home because people were thinking, let's go to, to Ahmed al-Shugri, my dad's home because he was a retired officer, he may show his ID card, the military ID card, they won't kill us. Like 50 people were in our home, all of them were killed. My mom can't just go back and be in the regime held area uh, or work with the regime, go back to a normal life. My mom can't go there where there is no, no, you know, grave for my father. We don't know where my, my father, they burned him. There is no grave for my father. My mom can't go back when I, when I, after six, seven months in prison, they told my mom I died. So they had funeral, they have ceremony for me outside. She can't go there to the same place and be while the regime is still in power. So what happens to all of these people in Syria, all of these stories you've shared with us today, if, especially in the region, but in Europe as well, after nine years, going into ten, the 10th tenth year of this war, everyone says, we've tried all these different ways, economic sanctions, political they, isolation, Turkey tried a military option, and nothing is changing the regime in Damascus. What should, does that mean for the Syrian people? They should try more. It means for some people that the entire world doesn't care anymore. And everything, every time you talk about human rights, you just saying bullshit. Because if you really care about people, if you really care about human rights, when you care about human rights, doesn't mean you just care about human rights in the US. Human rights is an international thing. You can't just, like in Sweden, they talk about human rights. You can't talk about human rights only in Sweden. It's an international thing. It's about the entire world. When you care, you should care about your neighbor, your neighbor here and neighbor in the other country and every human being around. It's like organizations who cares about animal. They care about animal everywhere. That's how human rights organizations should work. Care about everybody and provide the same help you provide to you, the person next to you, same to the person who is in Syria, Iraq, or anywhere else. So we can't normalize what ha the regime has done in Syria, what they're doing. We can't just like forget, okay, there is no other solution in Syria. While the regime in power, the situation is gonna be worse. It will never go to better during the regime time because I saw that in prison. When they transfer you to the next prison, you're going to a higher level of torture, of pain, of suffer. It's the same thing with staying with the same regime. We're going to a higher level of suffer. We can't rebuild, we can't restructure Syria during the regime because like you're just building a new prison for people with better walls, but it's still a prison and people are gonna be scared. We don't want to go, but we made this revolution in Syria to have a new life. We didn't lose five, more than 500,000 people and people get tortured and we lost our money, our homes, and cars, everything to go back to the same situations like before 2011. Okay. Thank you very much. Raja, I'd like to ask you about half of the Syrian population that is working on what Omar just described, building this new life, and people who have been since 2011 working to build a different kind of Syria, and that's the role of, of women in Syria. Your organization specifically works on women's inclusion, specifically in the case of Syria. Can you talk with us about what the international community can do to ensure meaningful participation by Syrian women? 
Thank you, Dana. So uh, maybe I want to comment on uh, the issue of no normalization with the regime before uh, Thank you. talking about the, Syri the role of Syrian women. <clears throat> like it's very important that we shouldn't forget that the dictatorship in Syria, it's there since more than five decades. So it's not starting like the human rights violations and um, like the oppression in Syria they didn't start in 2011. Like it started from before and um, just like an example um, that my father was in prison in the 90s and he was actually tortured in um, the security forces, in the political security forces and also in Tedmar prison. And this is just one case of thousands of cases that happened in the 90s and even like in the mm, uh, beginning of 2000, um, before the Syrian revolution. What happened after the Syrian revolution is that the world knows about it more. Like we were in more as black hole in Syria, so people don't know what's happening in the security forces or like in the prison, or it's not talked about it. While the Syrian revolution, when it comes that, like the aspiration of a new life, of a new values that we can base our mm, uh, society in, that like respecting of human rights and women rights in Syria could be the normal thing, not the aspiration only. This is what we try to do. and. Normalization with the Syrian government, the Syrian regime at the moment, means that we are postponing the solution, Post like making sure that the problem is continuing for a l another like decade or so, but it doesn't mean that it is a solution. This is like for the international community, for the neighboring country. Like Syrian people will ask for freedom again, now or later and the better actually to have a peaceful transition of power, a peaceful distribution of power. And this is why we are pushing for moving in the political process. And this is specifically for US government who can play a leading role in supporting the UN in making sure that the political process and political uh, peace agreement could be achieved, but also making sure that coordination with Russia, that like Syria needs to be changed to Syrian government, needs to be changed in a more like democratic and value-based government. And this is, could be done with the help of the international community and support for the UN in order to achieve that. But this is, won't be happening without really a meaningful participation of Syrian women and Syrian civil society. And this is where like, I'll come to your question. Since 2011, the Syrian woman has been playing a very important role, not only in uh, documenting human rights violation or like responsi responding like to the humanitarian crisis that is on the ground, but also women has played a role in uh, negotiating ceasefire in some of the area, calling for ceasefire in other area like September 2018, more than 10,000 women from Idlib signed a letter to the special envoy, Stefan de Mistura, for the to show it in the Security Council in order to have a ceasefire above Idlib. Why Syrian women participation is essential, and especially when we are talking about constitutional process, political process in all different domain, not only because it's more than half of the society is there, but there are different perspectives that is brought by women. Gender sensitive approach for the detainees file is essential, not only for the detainees themselves, but it's for their family. It's very important not only to hear from Omar, but also to hear from his mother, what she went through 
regarding Omar, what she wants in order to have justice for the case, not individually, it's for the whole detainee's file. So gender sensitive approach for solving the detainee's file in Syria is essential. And this is the perspective of women is very essential in that. Thank you so much for that. I want to again remind everyone watching online, there's still time to send in your questions. You can send them to policyforum at washingtoninstitute.org. Again, policyforum at washingtoninstitute.org. We do have one question emailed in. It is from Patrick Clausen from Washington, D.C., from the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. He asked the panel, you have not said much about the de facto authorities in Idlib. Who is running Idlib? What is their record on human rights and on delivery of humanitarian aid? Whoever on the panel would like to take that question. He knows that. منها في قوات لهيئة تحرير الشام وأيضا قوات للجيش الو أو الجيش الوطني أو الجبهة الوطنية للتحرير لذلك يعني كيف التعامل على مع حقوق الإنسان يعني نحن دائما موضوع الهجمات على المدنيين هو يعطي يعني يشغل الفصائل أو القوات المسيطرة عن هذه المناطق بالتعامل مع المدنيين ويتحول الأمر التعامل مع المدنيين هو مع المنظمات وليس القوات التي تسيطر على المنطقة وتتفرغ هذه القوات معظمها إلى المعارك مع قوات النظام وهي تكتسب شرعية من هذه المعارك من خلال المدنيين لذلك نحن دائما كنا نطالب نطالب المجتمع الدولي بحماية المدنيين والتدخل لحماية المدنيين حتى يكون هناك عملية واضحة لموضوع مكافحة الأرهاب أو عملية واضحة لمحاربة المتطرفين لذلك يجب أن لا يكون هناك حجة يعني دائما ما يتكلمون هناك عن وجود متطرفين أو وجود أرهابيين في إدلب لكن كم عدد هؤلاء المتطرفين؟ كم عدد هؤلاء الإرهابيين الموجودين في إدلب؟ يعني نحن لا نعتقد أنا آسف I'm sorry The, the power in Idlib in terms of who controls uh, the situation, the military situation and the security situation is distributed between uh, different parties the most um, prominent of those are Hay Tahrir Sham, uh, which is the um, uh, commonly known as HTS, uh, and the other one is the National Liberation Front, um, which are uh, uh, Turkey backed um, rebels that are in Idlib. They um, are the main uh, powers in Idlib. Um, and the these these military factions on the ground, wh you know, when we th when we talk about human rights and the role that they play, their main role on the ground is when the regime continue, especially when the regime is advancing and there are military operations on the ground, is to try to repel the regime's military advances on the ground and to respond to the regime's military advances. And when this happens, when the military, when when the Syrian regime is advancing and these armed factions are are uh, out fighting against the regime it gives legitimacy to those armed actors on the ground and that legitimacy then undermines the power of civil society organizations on the ground so what we've always asked for from the international community is to help us to achieve a ceasefire an enforced ceasefire so that the armed actors on the ground would have less legitimacy, less power in order to govern and to get involved in civilian affairs and so that their um, role would be transferred then to the civil society organizations and the other organizations um, there that are on the ground. فرض 
يجب على الجميع يعني يجب علينا كمؤسسات مدنية أن يتم التعامل معها حتى نستطيع تقديم الخدمات للمدنيين المحتاجين في تلك المناطق واليوم سوريا هي لم تعد سوريا تحكمها دولي يعني سوريا اليوم هي مناطق نفوذ تخضع لعدة أنواع من النفوذ وفي كل منطقة يجب أن نحن مضطرون للتعامل مع هذه السلطات حتى نقدم خدماتنا لذلك لا يمكن يعني لا يجب السماح لروسيا ان تتخذ من 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 موضوع محاربه الارهاب او او قتال الارهابيين ان يكون حجه لتهجير المدنيين السوريين وقتل المدنيين السوريين فهي مثل ما ذكرت بالمداخله التي قبل هذه انه هي تستخدم وتلعب على المصطلحات التي تستخدمها الامم المتحده وتوظفها لقتال لقتل المدنيين وتهجيرهم من منازلهم When we want to look at the, uh, I'm going to translate part from the previous. Um, so he said that the, what is the number when we when we talk about these areas? What is the number actually of these uh, armed groups compared to the civilians? It's a very small number, and in any conflict in the world, organizations, civil society, civilians need to deal with these de facto uh, um, these de facto authorities that are there on the ground. For us, we have to deal with these de facto authorities. And across Syria, there are different spheres of influence for different countries, for different um, armed groups, and we have to deal with those. But what Russia is doing is it is saying, as I said earlier today, that it's fighting against terrorism, and it's using the excuse of fighting terrorism in order to specifically target civilian populations. واليوم يعني هناك 25 ألف مقاتل تقريبا من الجيش التركي الذين دخلوا إلى أدلب في الفترة السابقة تقريبا 25 ألف مقاتل حسب التقديرات فهم جيش ناتو يعني أكيد لن يعني يكون مدربين على احترام حقوق الإنسان والتعاون مع المدنيين وهم الشعب المدنيين موجودين في محافظة أدلب الآن ينظرون على هذا الجيش على أنه يحميهم على أنه يساعدهم للبقاء في مناطقهم لذلك يعني إن لم يكن لدى المجتمع الدولي قدرة على إيقاف الحملة على محافظة إدلب أو حماية المدنيين في هذه المحافظة عليهم دعم هذه الخطوة الجريئة التي من الممكن أن تحمي المدنيين وأن تساعدهم على البقاء في محافظة إدلب According to the estimates that we have there are around 25,000 Turkish soldiers ground forces that are in Idlib This is a NATO army, and so uh, they can deal with the situation and ensure that the human rights and uh, security situation is um, of uh, uh, the right standard. And if the international community, now that Turkey is there on the ground, if the international community is not willing to put its own uh, peacekeepers or forces or to do whatever is required in order to protect the civilians in Idlib, the least that the international community can do, the absolute minimum, is to support its NATO ally, Turkey, which is trying to do the civilian protection itself. Thank you. Raja is going to add something as well. <clears throat> so thanks for the question. It's very important. And actually, I want to take the stage to have a call for action for civilian protection from all actors inside Syria and also in the neighboring country to really protect civilians and also adhering for human rights, women rights, minority rights, and refugee rights for all Syrians. For everywhere, for everyone, of course, around the world, but like specifically Syrians, because there are human rights violations happening with Syrians everywhere. Like many Syrians doesn't have even legal documents. Many Syrians don't know where to go. They are trapped inside Syria and outside of Syria, so we should remember that. But also very important to remember that there are responsibility. And this is, there is responsibility on the Syrian government because they are still the country who is representing Syria as a country in the United Nations. And this is, we shouldn't take this responsibility away. And the responsibility for justice and accountability is there for them. In the same time, I just want to give an example. When we were asking people in Idlib, are you 
like pre preparing yourself if there's any coronavirus uh, spread in the town, in the camp. And they were saying, what are you talking about? If we don't have the essentials, we don't have the wash needs for washing our hands or like the sanitary basics, what can we talk about like to prepare for, vi for the coronavirus epidemic in that area, which is very important to notice. And in the same time, when we are talking about bombing, air bombing, chemical weapons, really targeted attacks on area for demographic change. Sometimes like there is some proportion talking about human rights in some area. And this is with my call to adhering for all the actors to adhere for human rights in Syria and also everywhere. Thank you so much for that. So we are running short on time, but we have two more questions that were emailed in. So I'm going to say the questions really quickly and ask our panelists to respond in as brief as possible for these extremely dense and serious questions as possible. So to Rod, yeah. can you talk about the displaced people from Inlib and, and their living conditions right now? So are they in shelters? Are they living on the open? How do they get food, et cetera? And for Omar, you have been, were in many detention facilities in Syria, and also the Sidonia prison, which Amnesty International had put out a very specific report on, on the torture machine of, of, the, um, of Assad. Can you put your experience in a broader context? How many Syrians are being held by the regime today, and, and how many have died of torture? Thank you. بالنسبة لموضوع النازحين حقيقة كان هناك مأساة كبيرة عندما نزح بالفترة الأخيرة حوالي مليون نازح مثل ما ذكرت خلال حوالي سبعين يوم. There's a tremendous amount of humanitarian suffering. As I mentioned earlier, a million people were displaced in just seventy days. ما زال إلى الآن نستطيع أن نتحدث أن هناك أكثر من مئة وخمسين ألف نازح بدون مأوى. To this day, there are still 150,000 of those million who are without any shelter. لكن أيضا هو ليس الكثير يعني من نقول بأنه استطاع أن يكون له مأوى ليس المأوى التي نتحدث عنه بالشكل الذي نتخيله وإنما المأوى عندما يكون هناك حوالي 25 إلى 30 شخص ضمن خيمة واحدة أربعة بأربعة أربعة أمتار ضرب أربعة أمتار. And for those who do have shelter, it's not the kind of shelter that we might think of here. It's what we're talking about is people who are living 25, 30 people in a small tent that's four by four meters. أو كان عدد من العائلات الذين بدأوا يعني ينصبون بعض البطانيات أو بعض القماش على أشجار الزيتون وينامون تحتها. And some of them are just draping. Blankets or um, uh, you know tent covers on olive trees in order to have shelter. فحجم المساعدات الإنسانية رغم أهميتها التي تقدم الآن هي لا تتجاوز عشرين إلى ثلاثين بالمئة من حجم الاحتياج الكلي الموجود في محافظة إدلب. The humanitarian response is meeting the needs of only about twenty-five to thirty percent. Of the needs of the people in this area. يعني وصلت المعاناة الإنسانية قبل قبل أيام قبل حوالي تقريبا عشرة أيام أن يضطر أب إلى وقوف على قارعة الطريق في محافظة إدلب ويحمل لافتة ليعرض كليته للبيع مقابل خيمة لعائلته. The situation in Idlib got so bad that ten days ago there was a man standing on the side of the road in Idlib with a sign that said, "I will sell my kidney for a tent." واستخدمت كل المدارس ففعليا نحن الآن لدينا منطقة حدودية كانت قبل 2011 هي عدد سكانها حوالي 300 ألف نسمي الآن نتحدث عن أكثر من 3 مليون نسمي يتواجدون بنفس المنطقة This border area on the Syrian-Turkish border in Idlib used to have 300,000, a population of 300,000 people Today it is home to more than 3 million people فهذا الوضع هو خطير جدا لدرجة يعني نحن عندما نرا نعود إلى 2015 عندما وصل حوالي مليون لاجئ إلى الاتحاد الأوروبي كاد أن ينهار الاتحاد الأوروبي بسبب مليون لاجئ 
فكيف نحن نتحدث عن مليون لاجئ خلال 60 يوم او 70 يوم فمن سيستطيع ان يكون على قدر هذه على قدر هذه الماساه ليقدم الماوى والغذاء والمعدات النظافه الشخصيه واضف الى ذلك نحن مقبلون على شهر الصيف In 2015 the arrival of 1 million refugees to Europe almost broke the entire EU So how are we expected to deal with a million people being displaced in just 60 days and being able to provide them with shelter and food if that over the course of a year almost broke the entirety of the EU? لا مقبلين على شهر الصيف وهذا يعني يعني أن هذا ثلاث ملايين نسمي يعني أكثر من ستين بالمائة يعيشون بدون بنية تحتية جيدة فهذا يعني أنه نحن مهددون بانتشار أمراض وأوبئة أخرى ممكن أن تهدد سلامة المدنيين في هذه المنطقة. We're coming close to the summer now and that means for these <coughs> one million people who are living in unsanitary conditions without very basic uh, civilian infrastructure that we, there's a very big chance for the spread of disease and this would threaten this entire population. Thank you. Omar, I know this is a deep and serious question and we are running out of time, but I think it's extremely important that you have the opportunity to answer it. So please, the floor is yours. I think it's estimated around 250,000 political prisoners in Syria right now. Uh, and it's, I th I'm sure it's more. Uh, and how many people died There is no, nobody knows the numbers because the regime don't give you the body when somebody dies. But the amnesty said 14,000, but I don't believe that at all because I experienced more, uh, I seen more dead bodies than what we could talk about in news. In branch 215, I was numbering the bodies so that the numbers was like higher than 8,000 thousands. And even in branch 215, you have six floor. And every floor, like I was in, under the ground floor, which where we had 40, 50 people who dies every day, so 50 times 30 times 12 times 3, you have 18,000, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18. That's a lot of people. It's more than what we can see. And Sinai prison, higher level of torture, higher level of death, more people dies. And it's three floors and a floor under the ground with 100 isolating cells. So I'm just talking about two prisons. And in Syria, you have a lot of prisons and even they turned schools to prisons. So what's going on in Syria is Holocaust. Thank you for that. What I'm going to do now is invite Naomi from the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Muse Museum to come up and deliver some concluding remarks. And while she does that, I'd just like to thank our panelists so much for your testimony today and your insights and conclude for, for myself with just observing. We've heard every panelist today note that Russia has never compelled Assad to adhere to any ceasefire. There is no reason to believe that the March 5th ceasefire reached by Turkey and Russia is going to hold. We've heard about the horrific humanitarian conditions of the people in Idlib. This ceasefire agreement does nothing to address the people living in this open air prison or the humanitarian catastrophe in the last 60 days, let alone the last nine years. It does nothing to address the political process, which you've heard, again, compelling testimony from our panelists here about what will happen to the Syrian people if the, re if the world continues to be numb and passive in the face of what the Syrian people have experienced over the last nine years. And nothing about the ceasefire compels change by Assad or Russia or Iran, who remain active and essentially acting with impunity in Syria, except for the Turkish military operations in the past couple weeks. So with that, I'd like to invite Naomi to, to um, share some concluding remarks with us. Thank you for being here today. Thank you so much, Dana, and I want to thank you, Rob Satloff, and the entire team at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy for hosting this incredibly timely conversation. There's sadly too few discussions about civilian protection in Syria here in Washington and around the world. Uh, I want to thank the incredibly heroic panelists who are here with us. Uh, for now, close to a decade, the rhetoric has been that the conflict in Syria is coming to an end. It's not. Uh, and as we see increasing talks of normalization of relations with the Assad regime, we also see the conflict continue to morph and civilians continue to bear the brunt of those atrocity crimes that are being committed. As you mentioned, the ceasefire is critical, but as all the panelists mentioned, it's not a solution. 
What we need is a resolution and end to the killing, and as Omar so poignantly said, true accountability. We know that there has been a consistent pattern of pause and de-escalation, followed by extreme brutality. There is no reason to think that that will not be the case yet again. We also have to recall that efforts to facilitate a peaceful resolution have thus failed, lacked sincere political resolve, or been blocked by Russia, including within the Security Council. Our institution is committed to putting a focus on the protection of civilians, and that must be the primary priority of any Syria policy discussion. It is no less urgent than other near-term political interests or long-term strategic interests. There remains no international strategy to protect civilians in Syria. There remains no U.S. strategy to protect civilians in Syria. As we might recall, in 2018, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, when talking about Russia and uh, de-escalation zones and so-called safe areas, which were guaranteed by the Russians, the High Commissioner noted that they were far too reminiscent of Bosnia, which proved anything but safe. It's important also to remember that during the Holocaust, there was no U.S. strategy to save Jews until January of 1944, only months before the Holocaust came to an end. Thanks to the incredible efforts of the Secretary of the Treasury, Henry Morgenthau, who established the War Refugee Board, thousands, tens of thousands of Jewish lives were saved. We can't be complacent, and even today there are actions that can be saved, that can be taken to save lives. What we need is creativity, imagination, and political will to do so. There have been discussions in the past 24 hours in Congress about the importance of prioritizing civilian protection, discussions about the need for the implementation of the Caesar Act. I was struck as I walked into this building uh, that there's a quote on the wall, it's Isaiah 118, that says, come now and let us reason together. Syria is a bipartisan issue. The protection of civilians, the prevention of mass atrocity crimes is not owned by one political party. Every single administration has had to deal with genocide and large-scale crimes against humanity on its watch. Everyone needs to be united in finding a solution today. We need to support the whistleblowers like Caesar, people like Omar, others who have left Syria and at great risk are vulnerable, their physical security is vulnerable, their livelihoods are in question. We need to find creative strategies to help them and sustain them during the long journey that will be ahead to advance justice. We also need to support those that are working on justice and accountability, even here in the United States, such as DHS's Human Rights Violations and War Crimes Unit and the FBI's International Human Rights Unit. We need to track Russian and Iranian war crimes. The administration, has to implement the Caesar Act. It's been over three months. It's unclear what the impediments to actually moving forward on some of the specific actions within the Caesar Act are. And finally, when we're talking about Syria, we have to remember that it sends a dangerous signal to potential perpetrators elsewhere of a permissive global environment where norms protecting civilians can be violated without any cost. As an institution devoted to the memory of the Holocaust, we understand all too well the consequences of inaction in the face of mass atrocities. Syria has yet again shown us that the resolve of those committing atrocities against civilians is often greater than the resolve of those who seek to protect them. 75 years after the Holocaust, we seek and hope to uphold the commitment of never again. Yet we are struck consistently that the most common refrain that we've heard from our Syrian colleagues and partners is that they feel abandoned by the world. We know there's been considerable discussion of questions around use of force, and perhaps just in conclusion, going back to a testimony that we gave back in 2016 and have reiterated since then, there are no easy options to address the crisis in Syria today. But that is true in all situations where mass atrocities occur. We cannot let a lack of imagination or a lack of serious assessment of all options contribute to the commission of continued mass atrocities. Okay. We're happy to repost the testimony that goes into greater length and also talks about the 2008 nonpartisan genocide prevention task force, which found that the credible threat of coercive measures, including ultimately the use of force, is widely seen as a necessary complement to successful preventive diplomacy. Finally, just to end, we owe an immense debt 
to the Syrians on this panel for all of the incredible work that they have undertaken. As a country, we've benefited immensely from the Syrian American community in the United States. Holocaust survivors helped to build this nation and helped to further remarkable endeavors by their families, just as we know that Syrians today will do in the countries that they have sought refuge. Of course, our hope is that you will actually be able to return home to a safe, secure, and diverse Syria. Thank you very much to the panels, and thank you so much, Dana. Thank you all. And this concludes our policy forum today. Thank you all who participated online. And thank you again to our brave panelists um, for making the trip to Washington, D.C., for testifying yesterday to the U.S. Congress, and for spending time with us this morning. Thank you.